Welcome to this week's episode of A Kind Voice on Books. I'm your host, Erin Ray, and I'm so pleased to be with you tonight because we have the distinct pleasure of speaking with author P.J. Devlin about her collection of short stories titled Wishes, Sins, and the Wissahickon Creek. Welcome back to the show, P.J., and thanks so much for taking time to speak with us tonight. Oh, thanks. I'm happy to, to speak with you once again. Thank you. Um, Okay, readers, I have to say that this collection is absolutely fantastic. It's got just a little bit of everything, like the title suggests. So congratulations, PJ, because what you have done here is a real achievement. Oh, thank you. Um, These stories actually span a number of years, um, including the, the Withered Hope, which I wrote an early version of in 1973. So, uh, so thank you. (laughs) Actually, that was going to be my first question. Um, A a couple of the stories actually have the, the awards, excuse me, that they've accumulated um, listed after, after they play out in the book. And so it's pretty obvious that they weren't all written just for this collection. You said you started Withered Hope in the seventies. So you've been working on them for quite a while. Did you write any of them specifically to go in Wishes, Sins, and the Wissahickon Creek? Um, you know, that's a really good question. I did not um, – I didn't write any specifically for this, at least in the first cut, but I um, had major revisions on a couple of them. I, I revised them all a little, but the two that I revised significantly are the – the first one, which is um, I Wish It Every Day, and then um, the third one, which is Original Sins, and and also Roll On. So I guess I had major, major rewrites of those three. And that first one especially, man, what a powerful story and a really good lesson about using your kind voice. I don't want to ruin anything for readers who uh, are going to listen to this and then pick up their own copy, but let me just say that first one is you, you get out str- out of the gate really strong. Um, the last time you were on the show, we talked a little bit about your novel, Becoming Jonica, and I was curious if you could do a little comparing and contrasting between writing novels and writing short stories. And then I wonder, do you prefer one to the other? Okay, so that's a, that's a really good question for me. Um, I started out writing short stories, and when I went through the George Mason University creative writing program, um, all of our craft work was on short stories. So I do, I like them very much, but I think one of the issues that I discovered as I was writing the short stories is I I was trying to like cram an entire world into 20 pages. And so I do think that by inclination, I'm probably a novelist and yet um i love i love the short story as you know as a narrative way of oh how shall i say this i find short stories can be very emotional in a very short period of time um and that's the power of them so i i like them both i i suspect i'm a novelist though by nature interesting um When I'm talking to some of my friends who who write more professionally, they say that one of the hardest parts of writing a short story is the ending and knowing when a story ends. Um, A couple of your stories, I was shocked when they ended, not because it was not fitting, but because it was more poignant for the story to end when it did, as shocking as it Mm -hmm. was. I was curious, though, have you, how do you determine where the end of a story is? And also, have you ever decided a story was done only to be kind of, I guess, maybe haunted by it later and then ended up going back to it to write more on it? 
Uh, again, excellent questions. Um, I don't know whether I'm unique or not, but when I, when a story begins to sort of knock on my brain, um, typically for me, the start of a story for me um, is actually comes from a, a very strong image of the ending. So I, I get an image of a final scene and, and that, and that, and, and that's what um, motivates me to write the story. And I, I actually sort of then, then start, but I always know where I'm, I'm going. And, you know, the truth is that that's so in the novels I've written too. I've had a very strong sense of how the story ends. So um, that's one issue. And then the other thing that, you'll note in a number of my stories is I, I do like the framed story. The first story is an example of that um, where, where it's, it's a woman a man, whomever it's somebody I visualize them almost like sitting on their front porch and then, and thinking back and, and trying to figure out for themselves, the meaning of events that occurred much earlier in their lives. So I guess that's kind of how I work with endings or really how endings work on me. Um, and so you'll have, to, <laughs> you'll have to repeat the second part of the question. Oh, no, I just wondered if there had ever been a story that you oh. ended and then came back to later after, you know, thinking about it for a while. Yeah. But if I guess you started with the ending, that might not be a problem for you. Right, but but – Every story. I mean, I've, I've read writers who've said things like, you know, a story, in fact, it might be Stephen King, a story's never done. You just, you know, you can go back to it a day later, a year later, 10 years later, and you're going to change something in it, um, which I think is what makes them organic and meaningful. Um, but stories do haunt me. I, I, I can tell you that they haunt me. And uh, usually not usually not in terms of going back and and changing the end but but honestly the characters motivations continue to haunt me um so that was a good question nobody's ever asked that and and I don't think I've ever really expressed it that way but that's indeed uh that's true it's really interesting yeah. that uh you kind of get the mental picture of the ending first. I've talked to quite a few writers and, you know, done a little bit of writing myself and taken all sorts mm -hmm. of workshops and, you know, just talking to people. I don't think I've ever heard that before. And so that's really cool to hear you say that. Um, before we go any deeper into the actual writing, I had a couple of questions about more superficial aspects of the book. The first one sure. is the title. As I mentioned, mm -hmm. after reading the book, it's so fitting. And so I was curious about the genesis of that title. Where did it come from, and how did you settle on it? Oh, okay, An another good question. Um, I struggled and struggled and struggled with trying to find an appropriate title for the book. And honestly, thinking back now, I can't remember earlier attempts, but whatever they were, they weren't working. And it was important. It was important to me to capture the themes in, in the, in the short stories with the title. And after really, really struggling with it, um, it just came to me because, you know, and, and of course there's, two of the two of the titles are incorporated in the the wishes and the sins part um but i felt that even those two words had um you know a lot more meaning than the than the specific stories and then many i, I love the wasahican creek i mean so far everything i've written has well maybe not jonica as much but the wasahican creek if you talk about being haunted i mean that just the the park and the creek and the rocks I mean, haunt me in the best way possible. So, uh, you know, the stories reflect that. And I, I just tried to, I tried to capture, you know, kind of the soul of the stories 
But I will tell you, once I came up with it and, and my publishers and told my publisher, I mean, we were like, yeah, you know, that's it. So, um, but it, it was a struggle. Well, I have to second that sentiment. There could be no better title for this collection. Um, Thanks. The, the cover of the book, the design of the cover of the book is this really lovely stylized crow. I was curious, mm-hmm. do you, did you have anything to do with that? Was that part of your purview or was that, um, you know, somebody your publisher hired to design the cover? No, um, well, we, we did have, we, we did have a graphic um, designer, but the artwork, I um, developed the artwork myself. Uh, my, my oldest son is a, is an artist and he and I talked about, he, he's done all the covers for my books and um, oh. he and I talked and talked about, yeah, I know. Is that great? How many people have their own artists? Um, that is. But yeah, but he, he, we talked about different, different ideas and then, um, he said, you know, I, I feel like with, it would be, uh, be the, most, the most powerful presentation would be if you, you know, if we had sort of very specific symbols. And, and so then he's like, why don't you, you know, think about the book and think about, you know, different symbols within the stories. And so, uh, you know, I came up with a couple of them and, um, yeah, so I have to give credit to Andy Devlin for the for the concept of the cover as well as the artwork. And he also inside there's a little story about an artist and and like a little fast sketch that my son did too, a piece man. He he just kind of sketched that up for me when I asked him. That's really interesting, and I actually have a question about Peace Man in the next part of the show. But before we get there, listeners, it is time for us to take our first commercial break. When we get back, we will have more with tonight's guest, PJ Devlin, about her short story collection, Wishes, Sins, and the Wissahickon Creek. So stay tuned. Alchemy of kindness is one that we believe. When we reach out to each other, you know we both receive. Hi, I'm Bruce Cramble, one of the original hosts on A Kind Voice Radio. My song, The Alchemy of Kindness, is about the good things that happen when kind voices come together. What you're about to hear is a message from Claire Bloom, who is using her kind voice to feed hungry children. We hope that you'll help Claire with her mission and make our world a kinder, more connected place, one act at a time. Hi, I'm Claire Bloom. In 2011, I started End 68 Hours of Hunger in an effort to overcome childhood hunger right here in America. There are more than 16 million children in America who are hungry between the free lunch they get in school on Friday and the free breakfast they get in school on Monday. And what we know is that if we feed these children on the weekend, they can achieve 50% higher reading scores, 30% higher math scores, and are twice as likely to successfully complete the third grade, which is a primary indicator of high school graduation. To find out more, I'd love for you to be in contact with me. We have a website at www.n68hoursofhunger.org, or you can email me directly at n68hoursofhunger at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. A kind voice radio. Welcome back, everyone, to A Kind Voice on Books. My name is Erin Ray, and I've been speaking with author PJ Devlin about her really wonderful short story collection titled Wishes, Sins, and the Wissahickon Creek. Remember, listeners, if you have a question of your own for PJ, you can call in at 347-850-8907, or you can email your question to us at books at a kind voice.com. I'm sorry, dot org, that is. Um, okay, so PJ, in this part of the program, I really wanted to kind of focus on some of the show, uh, some of the, excuse me, stories specifically. Mm-hmm. Um while I was reading, a lot of these works 
seem to focus on the things that make people who they are, things like home and what that means and familial relations and friendships. And I was curious, do you intentionally focus on those topics when you sit down to write, or are these topics just so instrumental to what it means to be, you know, a human being that writing about them is kind of unavoidable? Well, I I do think that a lot of what I write at write about are sort of fundamental human emotions, but I I suspect each writer has that there are I guess there are different emotional movers for each writer, and for me, um, one of the things that I'm very interested in, and I think it shows through, um, is regret and reconciliation and maybe even, you know, resurrection or repair of yourself. So, um, yeah, I, I actually, I do think about that, but I, I don't, I don't like consciously say, Oh, let me write, let me write a story. about regret. <laughs> I just, say, hey, what could be something somebody did a long time ago that was terrible. But, but I just, I find that, that, such a powerful um, emotion, which does like generate change. So, um, and, and of course stories are about change. And so I guess that's my way of, of getting at it. But um, I, I'm, I'm not a writer who likes to really leave a story hanging. Um, like some stories I've read, they don't exactly end. They just stop. And and I like to end my stories. I, I like to, well, and 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 in some ways your characters kind of demand that of you. But I like to, I like to leave them with something at least. So, um, so yeah. I mean, I think all writers explore different themes, and and I guess those are the ones that sort of grab me. That's really interesting. Um, Another way that that kind of played out the whole, these stories seem to focus on the things that make your characters people, if I can, mm-hmm. you know, extend that yeah. a little bit, is the setting. Um, in a lot of these stories, there is a very strong sense of place, and it mm-hmm. just kind of permeates the whole work. And um, if it's you know, like you mentioned, the Wissahickon Creek, that creek plays right. a big role in at least one, a couple of your stories. And, uh, right. excuse me, um, there are lots of mention of really classic Philadelphia landmarks, especially in mm-hmm. that first story we were talking about called I Wish It Every Day, mm-hmm. which are beautifully yeah. rendered, by the way. And then uh, the hometown accents are, are thick in some of these stories. So can you talk a little bit about the importance of the Philadelphia setting in your work and how the sense of place has affected your writing. Uh, Yeah. I I think obviously you, you really captured, I guess where my, where my soul lies, but um, you know, I, my husband and I were raised in Philadelphia and love Philadelphia and both of our families go back. I don't know, well into the um, early 19th century. um, And, Frankly, I never thought I, I came to Washington area for graduate school, but I, I never thought I wouldn't go back. But, you know, life has a way of doing things. So I, I think that – and that's one of the things that I actually think a lot as an older person now. I, I always wonder at, at how much – how vital the first 20, 25 years of your life are in terms of impressing upon you that sense of place. Um, and I, 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 I don't know how better to describe it than it's just, you know, like, like you're, it's branded on me. Um, and, and I know like pretty much all the reviews of my work always note that, um, you know, setting plays, a part so strong that it's almost a character in my work and that I I don't know how to write otherwise, but I also feel that unless I can share with a reader 
almost the cat. I, I want the reader to be able to walk, you know, hand in hand with the characters and to feel she or he gets, you know, gets where the, where the character is going. So, um, and I don't know how else to do that except through place or setting. It's, you said a lot of really interesting things in that answer. Um, one of them being, you're curious as to how the first, where you spend your, you know, your first 20, 25 years, how that affects yeah. you. Um, mm-hmm. My guest last week was actually from not very far away from where I was, and she had written an, an eco memoir. Um, mm-hmm. It was just so interesting to hear her talk about where she grew up in, in the land and how deeply that resonated within me. It was kind mm-hmm. of shocking that I can speak to mm-hmm. that experience um, right along with you. It, it's vital to who you become. I, um, I think so. Go ahead. Well, I, I mean, I just, I think so. And, and especially in Philadelphia, which, you know, was one of the first heavily populated areas in the country, um, you know, as a as a young as a kid, as a teenager, as a young adult, I mean, in Philadelphia, literally, you walk down the road and there are houses. You walk along Germantown Avenue, which is a thriving area in Philadelphia, and there are houses that were that are still standing and still occupied that were built in I don't know, 1740, and it 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 as now that I'm older, it just absolutely blows my mind. You know, and I wonder when I was a kid, I just took it for granted because that's that's the way the city was. And I think some of that's what I, I try to work out through my stories and through setting. Like the wonder of it, that's, you know? That's insanely interesting that you bring up the age of the setting because my very next question, and I kind of felt a little bit bad about adding this in my interview because it kind of departs from your writing a little bit, so I feel like it's a teeny bit self-indulgent, but I'm curious, um, relating to the sense of place, especially in your story of the witch, we get uh, Mm. subtle tones of the part that history plays in the lives of your character and mm-hmm. knowing that Philadelphia has such a, a big place in the history of the country, I was curious, mm-hmm. as someone who, who, as you said, your soul is in Philadelphia, someone who's you know, intimately familiar with this place, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that history and its effect on the people living modern lives in Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. Well, you know that's a that's a really good question. One of one of the sorts of stories that or novels actually that I love to read are these like seven hundred page, you know, generation after generation after generation, and and so it's a little bit hard to capture in a in a ten or twenty page <laughs> short story. But but you know, my experience in Philadelphia. I mean, certainly there's tons of newcomers. But most you know, people do love the city, but people are very, very aware. And I was always aware and my neighbors were aware of, of where we came from and when we came and, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't know, three or four generations down of Irish immigrants um, who came and worked on work for rich people, honestly, um, who, who owned great estates around the city and so I, th- I feel like I was born at exactly the right time in some, well, at least for now, but I was born in 1950. And as a result of that, I was very, very close to my great aunts and uncles and spent a lot of time with them. And they lived in the house that their father built. So that was my great grandfather built by the, okay, here's a, I'm, I know I'm, this isn't logical, but my great grandfather was an Irish immigrant who worked for rich people. He built a house in, I think it was 1875, something like that. My cousin lives in it still. So that, that house, and it's not in a very wealthy area, but that house has been lived in continuously by people in my family. And, and I guess here we're just regular folks, not rich people. You know, it's so for the rich people with the estates, but it's so for the working people 
um, families just can 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 trace you know their ancestry without doing online or library searches just through family stories, and I think that's very very common in Philadelphia. And this is a weird little note, but I just to show how how Philadelphia families are. My I met my husband. Uh, we were 16. I didn't know him, but as we got to know each other better, we found out that his his grandparents or great grandparents, I guess, his great great grandparents lived across the street from from my family. Uh, you know, uh-huh. my my great grandparents, like at the we at the turn of the century, nineteen in nineteen hundred census. It's his family name and my family name right next to each other, and we met, you know, ages and ages later. But that's not atypical for Philadelphia. And so I guess that's why we love it, why we know that we're part of it. Does that make sense? It does. It does. And I love that story just because it kind of highlights, I mean, America is such a huge place. I mean, it's so that the people who live in Philadelphia are have the chance to be fundamentally different than the mm-hmm. in the Midwest versus the people who live on the West Coast, and it's just so interesting to talk to different uh, authors from different places around the country, and we're all American, and yet we all have such wildly separate experiences under that one umbrella. Mm-hmm. That's just fascinating to me. So I, I appreciate your thoughtful response on that. Mm-hmm. Um, now to kind of change the subject completely. Sure. Um, you mentioned a story called Peace Man, which if I'm not mistaken is the shortest story in this collection. Right. And listeners, that's Peace, P-I-E-C-E. Um mm-hmm. I have to tell you, it was one of my favorites, as short as it was, because I was so impressed with how much information you put into such a small space while still maintaining this really beautiful prose. Um, This is one of those stories that's probably going to haunt me personally for a while, Uh, because I have so many I have so many questions. <laughs> it's told from a first-person perspective, so we really only right. know the main character as the narrator. Mm-hmm. But like I said, I I want to know where she went after after the story closed, and a little bit about how she got there, or a little bit more, I guess. Um, and that's the the story that you referenced, where there's um, an artwork that is mm-hmm. integral to this character and her past. And there's a little picture of the artwork at the end of the story. And you said your son um, did that for you. Right. So it was, if I am following all this correctly, he he made a picture of that picture from your description in the story. Is that correct? So... Not a hundred percent correct, but but um, so the, I, I'll tell you the whole genesis of that story. That was the first story I ever got published. Um, I was in a, really? in a in a yeah. I was in a class, and we were just you know you, you're learning different pieces of craft, and we um, we were told to write a story um, about a picture, you know, or photograph, or painting, or whatever. And the same son, when he was, um, I don't know, he was maybe 10 or 12 with a little camera. Um, we were at the seashore, and there was a boulder, and it did say Peace Man on it. And he he, uh, he set up his little brother, had him stand on it, and took a picture of it. So we have a photograph um, that I that I looked at and wrote a story based on the photograph. And then, so Andy sort of did a, when, when we were getting this ready for publication, I was like, Hey, can you, you know, this is, can you quick draw that? And so he did. So now, you know, the true scoop of that story. Um, <laughs> I don't think anyone else, <laughs> I've never told the entire story, but that's it. Yeah. Yeah. We, um, there actually was 
you know, a big boulder at the shore that somebody had spray painted Peace Man on with that spelling. Is that so, weird? Uh, well, yeah, a little bit. Because I was also <laughs> going to ask you, where did the title come from? Because it's, yeah. you know, a piece of what, man? <laughs> but well, I, it's, it's true. Go ahead. But it's, well, I mean, it's a double entendre. And so, who you know, I I love it. And I guess that's why I chose, I've always loved it. And so I guess that's why I, you know, looked at it and the, and the story just spilled out. Well, time will tell, but I suspect that might be one of, if not my favorite story in this collection. Um, oh, thanks. It's, just, it's really well done. And again, readers, you can pick up your own copy. I'm sorry, listeners. You can pick up your own copy of Wishes, Sins, and the Wissahickon Creek um, if you follow the Amazon link in the show description of this uh, show. Um, and we will reference that again a couple times throughout the interview. Now, though, it is time to take our second break. We're going to get um, a little splash of good news on our Wednesday evening. So stay tuned as Tasha Rollins fills you in on some of the more positive things that are going on in the world. And after her contribution, we'll be back with more of um, my discussion with author PJ Devlin. Okay. Hi, everyone. This is Tasha Rollins with your Good News Report of the Week. This week's story is really cool. It comes from Woodbridge, Virginia, where a 29-year-old woman named Lauren Perrier is taking a new craze called extreme couponing to a new level. She's using her couponing skills to buy groceries cheap and a lot of times for free so that she can help feed the homeless. The process is not as easy as you may think, though. It involves rounding up numerous copies of the Sunday Circular coupons, finding coupons online, and enlisting friends and family to scour for deals as well. Then once the coupons are located and cut and matched up to the stores, she then hits the stores to shop. Once all the food is stockpiled, she turns them into tasty, healthy meals for the local homeless population. And she's not just making peanut butter and jelly sandwiches either. She creates dishes like spaghetti and meatballs, baked chicken with rice, or cold cut sandwiches. Once she has all the food compiled, she sets up tables and serves the dishes right on the street to any unsheltered people in need of food, serving about 100 to 500 people at a time. So far, she's fed over 5,000 people on a shoestring budget through extreme couponing. Although Lauren works a full-time job, she makes feeding the homeless a priority in her life. Due to the demand, she has decided to enlist help from her friends and family as well and has decided to start her own organization called For the Love of Others. The organization helps people in need through various community outreach events. So I know you're wondering, where does she get this idea? Well, it all started a few years back after the passing of her grandmother. Her grandmother would stop and talk to homeless people all the time to find out if they were okay. And Lauren says, I felt it was my obligation to keep her legacy going. And Lauren says that she hopes to feed 30,000 people by her 30th birthday on September 14, 2017. According to Lauren, the most common response she hears from the diners is, thank you, this is the first meal we've had in a couple of days. The reason I wanted to share this story with you is because it's a story of giving and a story of compassion. Many of us take eating food every day for granted, and some of us waste food, not realizing that there are people that don't eat for days at a time because they can't afford food. I hope this story has inspired you to get involved in either donating to Lauren's organization to help her continue to feed people or to even donate food to your local food bank or better yet, start your own movement to help feed the hungry. If you would like to see some pictures of Lauren and her helpers, please feel free to visit our blog at www.akindvoice.org backslash each one reach one. And if you would like to donate to Lauren's organization and learn more about the work she is doing, please visit the For the Love of Others page on Facebook. I hope this story has has not only inspired you, but moves you to take action to help those in need around you. I leave you with a quote of the week from Mother Teresa. If you can't feed 100 people, then just feed one. Thank you all for listening to this report, and I hope that it has inspired and uplifted you today. Have a wonderful rest of the week, everyone. Kind Voice Radio. Welcome back, everybody, to this week's edition of A Kind Voice on Books, where we've been having a really wonderful conversation with author P.J. Devlin about her short story collection, Wishes, Sins, and the Wissahickon Creek. 
Peter, mm-hmm. uh, not every character in this book is kind or considerate or even redeemable. But one who really goes a long way towards exemplifying the kind voice that we try to exemplify here on the show mm-hmm. is Althea Taylor. Um, after, uh, just for those who haven't gotten to the book yet, Althea finds herself um, suffering after the loss of her husband. And um, she repeatedly runs into a disabled gentleman who's nicknamed Lucky. And despite his peculiar physicality and his social inabilities, Althea is so nice, even when she's made uncomfortable or even afraid by his bizarre behavior. Can you tell the listeners a little bit about the character of Althea, where she came from, and how her story made it into your collection? Yeah. um, I, I guess... I guess Althea just is representative of so many, um, so many wonderful African American women that I've met and and friends with or know. I mean, it's not she's not based on any one person, and and in, in fact, characters really don't do well if they're based on one person. But um, I just felt that I wanted to sort of recognize and honor um, just some dear, dear friends who have, um, who work hard and do everything they can to raise their children. And um, so I just, I felt I needed to write a story um, just to, to honor what some of my friends have done to make me a better person. I guess that would have to be it. So um, she's not a specific person, but she's so, so many people. And, um, and I, I think, um, you know, she, she just represents, and of course she's, she's close, she is close to my age. So I do understand how life really can uh, smack you on the side of the head when when you least expect it and so i i thought as i wrote it like how how do people handle that do you give up do you take you know do you take the easy way out or 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 do you continue to be who you are despite the you know despite your house falling on your head basically so Again, you know, she just sort of came to me. Um, characters often do. Yeah. It's so interesting. It sounds like you're almost, you know, channeling um, a fictitious character. But that brings up a really mm. interesting point that I actually noticed clear back when I read the the novel, Becoming Jonica. Um, and yeah. that is how talented you are when it comes to uh, honestly portraying people who live totally different lives from you. Um, in mm. this in this collection, there is a moment where you are portraying um, a late to middle-aged man. I wouldn't say he's elderly yet, but... Um, and I just felt he felt so believable. And then there's another mm. story where you portray an 88-year-old lady, which clearly you have never been. Um, And so I wondered if you could talk just a little bit about um, how that works for you. How do you accurately portray a life that you have never led? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. Um, I think that what writers have to do to be authentic, especially or for their characters to be authentic, is we have to observe. And I think I've spent, you know, a lifetime observing. And I, I'm, in, I'm very interested in people and I'm very interested in, like, behaviors and, um, I don't know, tics and, and the way they express themselves. And I guess, you know, I, I hope, I mean, I, I think I'm able to absorb 
absorb their characteristics, and that would be a good word, absorb some of their characteristics and then, and then, you know, set them out as, as characters who stand on their own. And one thing I have to say, this is the magic of writing. And this is, I, so many authors have said it and it's, it's so true and I've experienced it is you start, you, you know, you have an idea, you have a plot, you have images, you have scenes in mind, but as you write the characters, the characters become who they are, you know, and, and so you actually let them tell their story through you. I mean, they, they take on a reality and it's not you. It's, it's, it's out, it's outside of you. And so, and, and Althea did that. I mean, I had an, I, I had an idea, you know, of a, of a woman facing some major, major life, an older woman, major life stresses. And, and what does she do? How does she become? So, I don't know. So I guess the only way I do that is just through watching people and talking to people and like empathizing with people, caring about people. So listening to you talk about and other authors actually as well talk about how a character becomes almost their own person. Um, they, they do. Yeah. Just to just to kind of comment on that, it's really the closest, and this is maybe like so dorky, but it really is the closest thing I've ever seen to actual magic in the world, in the world that we live in, because it they feel so real. At some point, they are less a part of their creator and more their own person. And I think that's one of the things that draws me to books and stories in general is that well, for lack of a better term, a bit of magic that happens when you create a person who almost turns real. I, I mean, it's tr- and I think it's magic. I do. I honestly think it's magic. And I, James Joyce, um, I think in Portrait of an Artist of a Young Man, says something about the artist or the writer. I mean, at some point, sort of, I, I think what James Joyce says is stand, stands back and clips his nails while the character, you know, acts on the, <laughs> on the page. And, and I've always thought, you know, it's true. And you know, I know, I know when I'm writing and struggling and not quite there, it, it's almost like I can tell when, when the characters come to life. And then it's, you know, you always want to have the best word and the best way of describing it and meaningful scenes and fill in the gaps but but the character but but the the action to me um just sort of takes over and so you know it, it's the struggle is different and much less once that happens well we are definitely of a mind on that concept um yeah. getting back to uh Althea one trait of hers that really uh, endeared her to me was her independence. She has three mm-hmm. grown daughters who very oh. clearly love and care for their mother very much and want to take care of her after their father mm-hmm. is gone. But their actions and um, their attempt to do so end up almost hemming Althea into a life she doesn't really want. And um, right. to avoid this, Althea kind of, you know, almost goes undercover and takes care of herself without really telling anybody until after she's already secured the life that she um, designs for herself, which I really Mm -hmm. uh, respect. But it made me Mm -hmm. think about the older people in my own life and wonder if Mm -hmm. I had ever unintentionally infantilized them through my desire to care for them. And I was curious, was that ever a message you kind of intended to to embed in this story, or was that my my personal interpretation of your work? Was that a conscious thing? Uh, how should I say this? I was very uh, – I wasn't no, – I guess I wasn't trying to send a message like, you know, young people only help old people as much as they want you to help them. But I, I, but I do think I have witnessed and, okay, probably 
did it myself with my parents where, you know, your, your parent and, and at 65 or whatever she was, she, she's got a lot of good years, years left, but, but yeah. you do, there, there's a very weird turning point in a person's life where, um, you know, you, like for the longest time, you're like, well, whatever happens, you know, I have my parents, and which is which is true. But then there's this like turning point where you realize that, oh, you know, your parents are older and and they can't, you know, <laughs> they're like, they're not going to be your soft landing. You know, you you have to take care of yourself. Moreover, you really have to watch out for them, and and so I do think. I I do think you can take away like independence or or try to you know well obviously try to plan or I think what it is is I think when you're a younger person that you think you know the best solution to an older person's problem in many cases honestly I think you probably one probably does but but so I just think the message was that if people are on their own two feet and, and making decisions and strong, you know, then it's just a matter of respect to let them. Yeah. So. Um, I got to say, uh, and this is, you know, borderline personal, but my own mother, who has been um, a teacher for, you know, in many different capacities, yeah. but as long as I've, you know, been conscious of having a mother, she recently retired. Mm-hmm. And this story really made me rethink um, how I have been interacting with her over the past summer and, you know, kind mm-hmm. of put into perspective my own concern for her. Like, Mom, what are you going to do? Well, she's an adult. Right. She's going to figure it out. Even, I mean, it's a mm-hmm. huge life change, but trust her. She's got it. She's fine. She knows exactly what she's doing. So I think this story uh, in its own way made me a better daughter, which is so fantastic. And I have to say thank you for it. Um, I'll have to to make sure my daughter reads it. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Well, and I'll definitely steer my mom to your collection and be like, look, look, I'm I'm a better person because of this story. And she'll be like, yeah, and you quit bothering me. So (laughs) no, that's that's actually very lovely for you to say. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I I liked, I did like Althea though. I thought she was, I don't see that was another one. She, her personality overpowered my conception of, who she would be in the story. So well, it was fantastically rendered. Um like I say, I I really respected her and also enjoyed her. I liked I liked her take no prisoners attitude to rearranging the mm-hmm. office. There was just a lot of Althea to like, so um I liked oh, that good. story a lot. Um Hi. One more question before we go to break, and it regards uh, a story called Withered Hope. Um, mm-hmm. One of your characters quotes a French poet, uh, yes. Rambo, if I'm pronouncing Rambo. it right. Um, That's right. Rambo, got it. Um, <laughs> and I wanted to ask you about your own personal relationship with this poet. Um, and does he mean anything, to, or does his work, I guess I should say, mean anything to you personally? And if so, what was it about these characters that brought that connection to the forefront while you were writing? So this goes back to my, you know, coming of age in the 60s, I think. And, you know, there were certain authors that we read um, I guess because it was cool to do so. And we, we, uh, lots of my friends and I and the people I hung out with read a lot of uh, Herman, uh, Herman Hess, Herman Essa um, novels. And, and we read Rambo. And uh, he's a very, very interesting um, 19th century poet. He stopped, he stopped writing poetry when he was 21. So these poems he wrote as a 17, 18, 19, 20 year old, um, kind of a 
like sort of a tragic poet, you know, background. He was a, a French poet. So I was very familiar with the work. And I do think I think I think his words are beautiful. But that was really me um, when I was writing it and thinking about the the character I created, the uh, the fella, the the driver who picked up the main character, um, or at least the narrator. Uh, I, it just again, it, it was like Rambo kind of dropped out of my consciousness into this guy's. Um, dialogue and I just think it was something that was stored away for years um, but he and it, his story is very tragic Rambo's so um, yeah I guess that's it I guess it's just you know uh, awareness of him um the sample of poetry that's in the book is very tragic, uh, but I yeah. I agree with you that it's just achingly beautiful. Um, mm-hmm. So that was something, another thing that I learned from this book that um, I need to look that up and pursue a little bit more knowledge about that particular artist because I didn't know that he was ever a thing, so now I do. So fantastic. Yeah. Just one more just one more way in which this book really knocked me off my feet. I love it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. No, he does write beautiful, beautiful, or he did write beautiful words. It's so crazy that he, he quit when he was so young. He, he had all that yeah. poignancy and all of that. Um, I guess you would call it sadness in him before, mm-hmm. <laughs> before he was even fully grown. <laughs> That yeah, was my I mean, he was brilliant. He was brilliant. Uh, and then I, I, I'm trying to remember his story. I think he went off to, I want to say, like North Africa or, or somewhere. I was going to say it says know, Africa just, in the story. Okay. Okay. Well, then, you know, that may have, that may have been, I guess that's where he went. Um, yeah. Yeah. A very tragic story. Uh, he died pretty young, too. He died when he was... Uh, fifty four ninety one. Uh, late thirties, I think. He, I don't think he lived long at all. Hmm. I think he was tragic. Uh, Thirty seven. Yeah, yeah, just a tragic life. And yet so interesting. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Well, folks, it is time for our third and final break. When we get back, we're going to ask PJ about some book recommendations uh, to add to our Goodread dot com. Okay group site. So stick with us for that. We will be right back. This is NASCAR driver Kurt Busch, and I am proud to support our nation's veterans. Do you know you can get a faster decision on your disability compensation claims by filing an electronic fully developed claim or e-claim on e-benefits? Take it from a guy who lives his life in the fast lane. Faster is better. Visit ebenefits.va.gov today to learn more. There's nothing wrong with reaching out when you need. I'll be there for you and maybe you can be for me. With a kind voice, a few kind words, an open ear for when you need to be. Hi, I'm Dominic Damaski, and I'd like to thank you for listening to A Time Voice Radio. This is a place where we have conversations with an eclectic group of people who are using their time voices to help make our world a kinder, more connected place. If you'd like to add your time voice to the conversation, we are currently looking for new program hosts, producers, and bloggers. For more information, please check out the Using Your Time Voice tab on our website, ourtimevoice.org. If you or someone you know happen to be creating a good story, we'd love to have you on our program. Please go to the radio menu at akimevoice.org and click on the show that best connects with your story. Then scroll down and click the guest information link. Thanks again for listening. And remember, please use your kind voice to make a difference and make somebody happy today. Kind Voice Radio. Wow. 
Welcome back, everyone, to A Kind Voice on Books. My name is Erin Wright, and I've been having the best time with our guest tonight, author PJ Devlin. Oh, thank you. PJ, thanks so much for making time to speak with us. I, one oh, more time, great. your short story collection is fantastic, and I loved reading it, thank and you. I've had a lot of fun discussing it with you. Um, well, thank you. For listeners... Oh, you're welcome. For listeners who are new to the show, in the show description, we have links both to the Amazon page where you can purchase your own copy of PJ's book, highly recommended you do so, as well as a link to our Goodreads.com group page, and that's where we keep a list of book recommendations that we collect from all of our live guests. So, uh, PJ, last time you were with us, you told us about some works by Meg Wallitzer and Octavia Butler, Uh who, by the way, you reference in the story um, about Althea, Roll On, which was great to read, by the way. I felt felt like I was in on that personal, like, little Uh, (laughs) that I was like, hey, I knew she was a fan. Um, (laughs) So, have you read any good books since our last visit uh, that you want to tell us about? Um, well, I, I read lots and lots of books all the time, but I thought what I would, um, the books I would recommend tonight should be short story collections that I love. Oh, cool. And Yeah. And so I, my favorite short story I think that I've ever read is called Griffin by Charles Baxter. It's, it's just everything you want a short story to be. And uh, Charles, Charles Baxter is a wonderful writer, but he also has a short story collection, which is called Griffin. And the short story Griffin in, is uh, included in there. And so excellent, excellent book. Um, another uh, book of, well, and I love Stephen King. I really love Stephen King. And so he recently came out with a short story collection called The Bazaar of Bad Dreams. And uh, it, it's it's just it, like his introduction. And I think he ha- he talks a little bit about why he wrote each story. So I very strongly recommend that. And then let's see. Okay, so then the other short story collection that I'll mention or the short story writer um, is Flannery O'Connor and uh, I think she just wrote short stories and you can you can get her complete collection but really really interesting powerful short story writer Uh, I remember a little bit of Flannery O'Connor from my, Mm. my school days uh, so right. I can second that recommendation. Can I ask oh, you, though, yeah. what, what is it about Charles Baxter's writing that makes him one of your favorites? Because I, I think he writes very clearly and directly, but he, like, he completely gets you know, to human experience. And Griffin, which I, I can't even tell you how much I love it. I, I could reread it even while we're <laughs> talking here. Uh, the, the thing about Griffin is it's written, it, it's written from an adult perspective in first person, and yet it's the story of um, a boy who, a boy and, and uh a class of of children at school and a substitute teacher. And I mean, she really changed their life. Um, I, I guess his voice and his tone bring, you know, bring me in from the very first sentence. Um, Just, he, he just, he, he, he has wonderful stories and he has wonderful craft. And again, you feel like you're sitting there, you know, in the classroom and you're watching the the uh, substitute teacher. And she is, her name is what, Miss Forenzi. She, she is one of the best characters ever, at least in my opinion. So uh, I, I, I guess it's just his, his tone, his straightforwardness. They're easy to read and yet they're meaningful. So he, he's a wonderful writer. And, and I've seen him at, um, haven't met him, but I have been at writers' conferences where he's spoken, and he's terrific. And he's written a book 
on writing. I don't remember the title of it, but it's also just lovely, lovely, important work. Excellent. Well, um, I will ask... Erin Ray, go ahead. Well, I just want to say one thing. You know, whether it's a novel or a short story or a collection or what, it's about the story. It's about whether or someone can tell a good story. And, you know, Baxter does. That's pretty much all anyone ever needs to say to me. You know, this particular yeah. author or this particular storyteller can really tell a mm-hmm. good story, and I'm on board. So mm-hmm. I personally will definitely be checking out uh, Charles Baxter pretty soon, and yeah. I will add those to my list so our listeners can look them up if they happen to miss the show. Um, mm-hmm. Gosh, PJ, thanks again for being on the show. It was really my pleasure. Well, and you asked some <laughs> you asked questions that I had never really thought about before. So, congratulations um, to you for that. And, and it was I, I enjoyed it completely. Well, thank you very much. I'm so glad that you did. And we'll talk to you next time um, you have a book out. I'm sure you're on my my hot oh. list. So, oh, okay. Well, I'm working on it. So, thanks, Erin. <laughs> no rush. Take your time. We'll be here. Okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Well, listeners, we are about out of time for this week, but uh, before we go, I have a few people to thank. First of all, Tasha Rollins contributed our good news report tonight. It's always so nice to get that midweek shot of positivity, and she picks really the best quotes, so thank you, Tasha. Thank you, as always, to our producer, David Levins. His advice and assistance is really invaluable, so thanks for everything, David. And thanks to Jackie Sandor, who wrote and performs our closing song, which is called A New Kind of Friend, and it's really lovely. It's great that she lets us use that, and we uh, we appreciate it so much, Jackie, so thank you. And possibly most importantly, thank you listeners, because without you, there would be no us. And I'm already looking forward to joining you next week uh, on Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern. So everybody have a fantastic weekend, and until then, happy reading. Well, hello, fellow soldier, how's your day? Walk and sink away I want to know your thoughts now Yes, it's true And that blue bird He flew by now just for you Step outside You don't know who you'll meet Feel the bitter patter Of the street Go, come link elbows with me. Friends. Ooh, and-
Heads up, Old Navy denim lovers. Today is the last day. Jeans for the family are just $15 for adults, $12 for kids. Plus, today is your last chance to redeem your super cash at Old Navy and Old Navy.com. Better hurry, valid 211 and 212. Select styles only.